So pathology then, we're going to talk about incidental pathology that you may see in the setting of ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. I also want you to be able to recognize intervention related pathology and things that might occur. Hopefully we're preventing these things with our ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, but maybe not. Maybe you need to recognize these things or make sure that they haven't occurred. We're not diagnosticians, but nevertheless it's nice to be able to recognize these things and to react to them and, and form appropriate treatment plans. So I'll start first with vascular pathology, which is a big category. Why do I start with that? Well, it's probably the most common thing that you are going to encounter. This is a very nice article that Brian Seitz wrote, wrote back in the infancy of ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. And uh, the first thing you've got to recognize is that uh, in this big series of 4,000 blocks, there are actually eight cases, which it's not a high number, but you will come across these things in your clinical practice. But the other is almost all of these eight are vascular pathology, so it's probably the most common thing you're going to encounter. Uh, there's lots of interventional uh, uh, pathology that you can see. These are some uh, consequences of some of the interventions that we do. Uh, these are the, some of the more common ones. Uh, hematoma formation can form from extravascular blood. The ultrasound appearance of that will depend upon the age and organization of the clot that forms. Uh, it has a, a, a temporal sequence of organization and therefore a mixed echogenicity picture that evolves with time, eventually leading to either resolution or seroma formation. Pseudoaneurysm is very similar to a hematoma, but now we have the presence of flow, the so-called two of fro or yin-yang appearance on Doppler, something you may see from time to time. If you puncture arteries and veins together, sometimes you'll wind up with a fistula between them. Thrombosis, dissection, stenosis can also occur. These are things to be on the lookout for in your practice. Okay, so here's the first test thing. If you, if you know the answer, please shout it out. This is an axillary block that I did a few months ago. Uh, we start scanning the axilla at the level of the conjoint tendon. You'll notice the axillary artery here, conjoint tendon here. That looks okay to me. But of course, we're good. We like to look around. And it looks a little bit different here. Okay, so if you think you know what's going on, shout it out. We're still at the level of the conjoint tendon, but now the artery looks a little bit different. It's enlarged, it's eccentric, maybe some, something in its lumen as well. And a similar picture now for pathology, we're going to look around at multiple short axis views, multiple long axis views, maybe some Doppler, just like you do in a sonographic study. And here's a long axis view. All right, any takers on this? I don't hear anything. This one I thought was the easy one, yeah. That's an aneurysm of the axillary artery. Uh, this was actually an incidental finding for us. Uh, although we had done a complete history and physical, this man actually eventually admitted that he had, had sustained a gunshot wound to his axilla. And uh, we didn't uncover that in his HMP, but after we scanned it, uh, he had actually had an aneurysm formation there. And, uh, and on further examination, we actually found a, a fairly well hidden bullet entrance wound on the back of his arm. Uh, we actually did an axillary block on this patient. But, of course, we chose to go in a region where the artery was not aneurysmal. And ultrasound gives us a lot of choices. We can block, you know, do blocks in a lot of different places. We're not going to choose to go where the aneurysm is forming there. All right, here's another one. Saphitous nerve block. We're going to use the uh, subsartorial approach as Ban and Tamura popularized. We're going to be in the mid-thigh. Uh, something looks wrong here. We can see the skin surface on the top. Sartorius muscle here. Uh, this would be our uh, femoral artery, or more formally, the superficial femoral artery. That's what we're expecting to see. Okay, short axis view, maybe not enough information. Long axis view, any takers? Yeah, this person has a vascular graft because they had a bypass graft, of course. And now, I have to admit, in the past, I would have been scared off. I wouldn't have done the block. But these days, of course, no, no problem at all. We went ahead and did the block. Here's our artery, sartorius muscle, and look, we get a perfect donut around the saphenous nerve and the other nerves of the subsartorial plexus. So in the era of imaging, we feel like we can work around these things that we may identify in terms of pathology. All right, here's another one. I think Ricky alluded to a lot of these phenomena already. Uh, femoral artery, femoral nerve blocks, skin surface here, looks like femoral nerve. We heard a lot about the acoustic enhancement artifacts, posterior acoustic enhancement that occur deep to vessels. Any takers here? Well, it's the uh, it's arterial plaque. You can see plaque on the wall. So there may be implications for uh, post-operative uh, anticoagulation and management of those patients. You'll see this a fair bit. 
All right, uh, here's a median nerve block. I've got video for you. Uh, median nerve is here. We're uh, near the antecubital fossa. Here's uh, actually uh, uh, the brachial vein. Doesn't look normal though, does it? This person's a street drug user. What do they have? They've got venous thrombosis, upper extremity venous thrombosis, not the more common deep venous thrombosis of the calf or leg. This person has venous thrombosis in the upper extremity. I think I've got another shot of it for you here. There's still flow in this vessel, but you can see on the walls you've got the uh, formation of the thrombosis. And again, implications for perioperative anticoagulation. All right, popliteal block. Uh, this is something that I'd like you to pay attention to because I'm seeing it more and more as I look more and more carefully. Any takers on this one? This is a popliteal nerve block. We're looking at the uh, tibial nerve here. So this will be on the uh, medial side. Here's the comparineal nerve. Something wrong with those nerves though, right? Any takers? Yeah, this is... Uh, this patient has advanced diabetes, and this is the angiogenesis, the neovascularization. When I see these pulsatile nerves, I'm a little bit more careful about it. There's no question these people are more vulnerable to injury, right? They're forming those new vessels because their current ones are not functioning properly. You can compromise the blood supply. The regenerative capacity is going to be limited. I'm always on the lookout for these days when I, when I block people with advanced diabetes. I'm seeing it more and more as I look care more carefully at these nerves. All right, axillary block. I hope everybody can get this one. Level the conjoint tendon, axillary artery. You see some nerves around it. All right, any takers there? This one I hope everyone gets. I think Ricky has this one totally down. This, of course, is the uh, intravenous injection. We've managed to uh, place our needle not only uh, within uh, a vein, uh, an axillary vein, right adjacent to the axillary artery, but also inject within it. You can see the bubble cloud of the injection, right? There's, there's small amounts of pre-existing uh, gas within these saturated solutions that we tend to inject. There's molecular and cellular elements in the blood, such as lipids and proteins such as albumin that stabilize those bubbles. They get rapidly heated. They distribute according to the turbulence, the injection. That's what you see on the ultrasound image. We see no such contrast when we inject extravascular because the phenomenon is different. The surface tension is higher. It doesn't get warmed as rapidly. You don't have those elements to stabilize the bubbles. But intravascular injection is something you should be able to pick up and pick up quickly. All right, here's another example. Uh, we're again in the axilla. Uh, you can see axillary artery here and take a look. This is an example not of an intravenous injection, but an intraarterial injection. Looks very similar. But of course, the flow in artery is more rapid. Therefore, the bubble cloud disperses more rapidly because it's carried away outside the plane of imaging. Something to be on the lookout for. Uh, here's another example. I got one more for you. Uh, there's another. Uh, this is an out of plane technique. You can see an intraarterial injection. Probably one that we did at, uh, a few years ago here. Uh, this, this is not a novel mechanism. This has been investigated since the 1960s. The original thought was that there's cavitation. In other words, there's a severe pressure drop along the length of the needle. Today we know there's more to it than that. In point of fact, the pressures uh, that you need and injection speeds you need to generate cavitation are quite high, probably exceed those that we actually use in clinical medicine. It's the more the fact that we've stabilized and rapidly warmed the pre-existing uh, gas in saturated solutions of local anesthetic. Um, you may think that we've made a big dent in the problem of systemic toxicity. We don't have much evidence for that. But I think this is a problem that we can solve, and we will solve through education and teaching, and by rapid identification, by looking at videos of the type that you just saw. So I think it's important to pay careful attention to that in your clinical practice, and hopefully you can carry that away and use that. Um, there is one point that I want to make, though, in regard to uh, intravascular injection. And, and the resultant local anesthetic systemic toxicity. And that is, if you look at the case reports, um, you know, we've recognized, of course, ultrasound's not a panacea. Uh, it may reduce things like intravascular injection or vascular puncture, but it's not going to completely eliminate it. But the point I want to make here, though, is if you look at all the cases where there's systemic toxicity, such as seizures or cardiac arrest, there's no procedural images. Whereas if you look at the same people who have reported uh, images of the procedure, no symptoms at all. Now I understand you need something to publish it, but there's no cases where we had symptoms and images. And I, and I think that attests to the importance of recognizing the images quickly, rapidly, 
you know, good image quality is essential for the safety of our techniques that we're going to talk about at this conference. And I think we are making a dent in the problem of vascular puncture. Um, you know, we have a lot of series now with no vascular punctures, uh, but it's going to take some time till we really refine our skills and really get all these procedures down. All right, I have a few minutes left, so maybe I'll move on to abnormal masses. We'll see how well, we're getting towards more advanced stuff, so I hope we have some uh, people who can take some guesses at these images. Here's a popliteal block, uh, the type that we do in the popliteal fossa. We inject right at the level of the bifurcation, as Carlo and uh, Bernhard were talking about earlier. Uh, you can see the uh, tibial nerve here on the medial side, common cranial nerve here. Okay, any takers in terms of what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is, this is a, you can see a fluid collection here, right adjacent to the nerves. This patient had severe posterior knee pain. There's also surrounding edema, but fluid collection between the semimembranosus tendon and uh, the medial uh, tendon of the gastrocnemius is probably the, the most sensitive and specific sign of a Baker cyst. That's a bursa that communicates with, with the knee joint and can fill up with, flu with the joint fluid, typically in the setting of pathology. You will see it from time to time during, an, uh, during a popliteal block. And this patient, actually, we went ahead and did a, a popliteal block anyway. And we were careful not to puncture the cyst, and we referred him for uh, further follow-up. Now, here's another example. This is a surgically confirmed Baker cyst with a crescent appearance. Uh, typically dark uh, fluid on an ultrasound scan. You'll see it you know, once in a rare while uh, during a popliteal block. Okay. Here's another one. Axillary block, again a few months ago, axillary artery, conjoint tendon. Looks good. Everyone can uh, see the image. No problems, right? Wait a minute. Something looks wrong here. All right, any takers on this one? I'll be impressed if someone can get this diagnosis. Any takers? I think I see some. Yeah, what do you got? Tumor. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. That's an excellent uh, Peter there. He's got it. Um, yeah, this is a tumor. And in fact, uh, looking at this image, it looks like this mass is in continuity, probably with the median nerve. It's a little bit eccentrically placed, very large, what you might call ancient or giant, a cystic degeneration. No internal calcification. All those signs pretty much lead us to the diagnosis of a giant or ancient cystic schwannoma, which is what this patient probably has discovered incidentally. Uh, he's under, I don't have the confirmation of that yet. Uh, he's, he's had an MRI. He's uh, scheduled to undergo biopsy and, and may need a resection. These can typically be resected fairly easily because of the, the eccentric tumor location without disturbing the rest of the nerve. But he's probably going to uh, need some, a biopsy and further surgery, which is ongoing right now. But, uh, yeah, so be on the lookout. This is, uh, you know, you will see this from where a while. This patient actually had no symptoms in the axilla. Okay, femoral nerve block. Uh, uh, Ricky's already alluded to this earlier today. Uh, hard to see the femoral vessels, but you can see very nicely uh, this is a, an inguinal lymph node. You can see that the, the lymph node is, is not round. It's more of an oval, sometimes a reniform shape. Uh, you can see the hilum in the middle, uh, not too large. A lot of different features that you want to look at. Uh, here's another one, a little more concerning now. Periortic lymph node uh, during a cervical plexus block. Uh, some internal echoes there, a bit more concerning. Uh, I do a lot of cervical plexus blocks for thyroid surgery, so of course we're going to come up with a lot of findings on those scans. Um, that's a lymph node you might see. And then um, uh, these are some of the characteristics that you want to look for. Uh, size is important. Uh, larger than one and a half centimeters is a uh, rough rule. None of these rules that I have listed here are perfect, right? They, they don't have you know, perfect sensitivity and specificity. But these are the things that might raise, raise your concern if you see these findings. The shape, you know, the uh, malignant lymph node tends to fill up, right, and become rounded, as opposed to the uh, uh, benign or reactive lymph node, which will have an uh, oval shape or reniform shape. Uh, Well-defined borders, if it's benign, poorly defined, if it's not calcium, Almost always a bad sign with lymph nodes or with thyroid pathology. Something to be on the lookout for. Um, blood flow pattern. You can look at different patterns of vascularization. I did refer a patient recently for a workup for a lymph node. Uh, I don't have any reservations about it. I, I was wrong, actually. The um, patient turned out to have nothing concerning, but, but I felt like I had compelling clinical reasons. The patient was an elderly man. He was a smoker with a history of alcoholism. He had actually a weight loss 
And now during our block, we'd pick up a lymph node in the neck. I was wrong. It wasn't pathologic, but I felt like I had not only sonographic reasons to refer him, but also patient history reasons to refer him for follow-up. So even though I was wrong there, I don't really have regrets about that as a path of workup that's appropriate for the patient. Uh, here's some more thyroid pathology. Uh, I can tell you that I've actually incident, uh, diagnosed two patients now with incidental uh, thyroid cancer. They went on to undergo biopsy and thyroidectomy, and they're both uh, happy and healthy. And so something to be on the lookout for. Uh, you know, if you see something suspicious, refer the patients. I have to admit, I don't like looking at the thyroid almost for that reason. I'm, I'm almost worried that we're going to pick up too many uh, 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 findings that, that are, that are um, uh, not going to lead to, to, you know, uh, uh, concerning findings, but right now it's the opposite. Everyone that I picked up has actually turned out to have concerning pathology that needed uh, surgery. Uh, here's another uh, grossly distorted thyroid gland that you might uh, see, if you're, particularly if you're doing these blocks for thyroid surgery. And then uh, here's one more uh, popliteal block. Let's see if anybody can get this one. We went over a lot of the echo texture from Bernhard, from Carlo, about what these nerves uh, look like in the popliteal fossa. I'll give you a hint that this is the tibial nerve here, and this is the common perineal nerve. And you can also got the scale here for reference. All right, any takers on this one? I'll be impressed if we get a... Uh, Peter, anyone? Uh, Chris, uh, there's got to be someone. Ivan, who, who can get this one for us? Neurophimatoma, that's, that's not a bad guess. Um, it's pretty close. It's CMT type 1A, um, charcot marie tooth one of the few conditions in which you get markedly enlarged nerves. And they're enlarged not because you have more fascicles. They're enlarged because the fascicles themselves are larger. This, uh, and, I mean, some people raise the issue. You have a degenerative process now. On the other hand, these people need a lot of foot and ankle surgery. We typically do blocks in this setting. We limit the volume. We limit the drug. We're careful not to inject inside these large fascicles. Um, I think that would be a very bad idea in the setting of a patient who has lim limited uh, regenerative capacity. But this is something to be on the lookout for. This patient actually had a diagnosis that was questioned, but he had the classic sonographic features of enlarged nerves from fascicular enlargement. 